My name is Maria Abreu. I'm a gastroenterologist at the University of Miami, and I'm so pleased to see that so many people are hungry tonight and wanted to come here for the food. Um, we have a, a great panel of wonderful colleagues of mine from around the country, um, and, and it's my job to keep them on time, but I'm not worried. Um, get you fed, and I've cooked all day. And, um, and just tell you a couple of housekeeping things that I think all of you know if you have cell phones, pagers, which sounds like an anachronism, the pagers part, please silence them. All this, all, we're very, very hip and cool here, so all of the slide presentations you'll be able to download if the, the Wi-Fi should connect to a website, um, to a Wi-Fi thing that you can download these presentations that are in, if the instructions are in your booklet. On your tables or iPads that we're gonna use to have you send us questions, and my plan is to sift through the questions at the end of every presentation and ask our presenters to address them. Um, this evening's symposium is sponsored by Takeda Pharmaceuticals. Um, the restrooms are outside and to the left. Um, after the meeting, the evaluations we want are through the iPad. We're not gonna give you a paper certificate. You're gonna get these uh, via email, okay? And so with that, um, I'm gonna kick it off. Uh, again, like I said, we have a, a terrific program. We're gonna start the program with uh, Dr. Miguel Reguero, who's a professor of medicine and head of the IBD section at the University of Pittsburgh. And Miguel is gonna talk to us about the different mechanism of actions of, of biologic agents. Oh, no, I messed up. Forgot about the questions. Well, thank you very much, Maria. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here tonight and a pleasure to have everybody here. Um, my role in the next uh, about 20 minutes is to discuss the overview of the current and emerging treatments in IBD. Um, I will focus a bit on the mechanism of action. I don't know if the first slide is gonna pop up or not. Um, I'll go back one. So to focus a bit on the mechanism of action, but what I plan to do in the second half of the talk is try to give you some semblance, in my opinion, based on the data in positioning biologics. I think that that's one of the questions that we're asked most, one that you all struggle with when you see the patients in your practice, um, and I have a table at the end uh, that will summarize that as well. So this is a slide from a study that was published in GUT in 2012, and not that I expect everybody to see and remember every single aspect of this slide, but I think it provides a good template and overview. And while this is three years out of date, I think this provides some basic understanding of the mechanisms of the cytokines in play for IBD and some of the drugs that have been developed that we'll use to treat IBD. So just to recap, and I think most of us know this now, there are four anti-TNFs and two integrin antagonists for IBD. Infliximab and adalibumab, both approved for Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. Ceratolizumab for Crohn's, golibumab for ulcerative colitis, and then natalizumab for Crohn's and vetalizumab for Crohn's in UC. And that's true in the United States, I realize, depending on what part of the world you're living, uh, that may vary. So these are the four anti-TNF agents. You can see the three IgG on the right-hand side and the one that's an FAB fragment on the left, uh, ceratolizumab, which has some to do with immunogenicity, but I think in terms of pregnancy, ceratolizumab is one that is borne out as not crossing the placenta, where the other three can, but are also uh, category B in safety. I'm not planning to spend too much time, but to put the context of treatments, I've broken this into Crohn's induction, Crohn's maintenance, um, and then ulcerative colitis induction and maintenance. So these are the anti-TNFs going from the left-hand side, infliximab to ceratolizumab in the green bars, adalimumab in red, and then ceratolizumab again on the green on the right. I will make the point that there are no comparative effective studies today comparing one agent to the other. However, when you look at the overall induction rates for these agents, they look similar numerically. I'm not gonna cross compare except to say that there's a similarity in a numeric value. Similarly, the maintenance data in anti-TNF are presented here. So accent one infliximab, charm adalibumab, 
and then the precise studies were seratolizumab on the right. And I think that there are a few, a uh, couple of take home points from this slide. One is that there was statistical benefit in terms of maintenance with all three anti-TNFs in Crohn's disease over placebo. And two is that there seems to be a fairly descriptive drop off, if you will, in maintenance benefit over time. Now, this doesn't go out to five years, but I think most of us have accepted that at five years, about 50% of patients will lose response uh, to that biologic. Switching gears to ulcerative colitis, the top two bars are with infliximab, uh, the bottom two are with adalimumab and then golimumab. These are short endpoints between six and eight weeks. And again, that you can see that the induction efficacy with these agents compared to placebo was statistically significant. And we see similar similarities uh, between the groups of agents. So that's the anti-TNFs. And I realize I did that quickly because I think you've seen many of these data a million times before. Well, so now what about the anti-integrin molecules? And we really have two. So the alpha-4, beta-7 um, um, agents and the alpha-4, this is alpha-4, beta-7, vetalizumab and the alpha-4, natalizumab. As you know, the gut selective specificity, if you will, of the vetalizumab compared to that, that is the brain, CNS, as well as gut with natalizumab. And that's probably the biggest distinguisher between the two. When we consider the efficacy data with these agents with a NAC2 natalizumab, we see that at an early time point, response at uh, 36 weeks and then remission at 36 weeks, that there was a statistical benefit of natalizumab over placebo. Quite honestly, I think the reason we're not using natalizumab the way that we initially probably would was the PML. So patients with JC virus positive, uh, the PML rates were such that we stopped or have not used this agent as much as we probably would. Switching to vetalizumab, the newest kit on the block, if you will, these are the Gemini 2 and 3 data. And again, in terms of overall week six and week 10, um, induction of clinical remission with uh, vetalizumab and Crohn's disease will come to ulcerative colitis in a minute, but still a benefit compared to placebo, maybe not the same as we saw with UC, and probably the early endpoints are not as robust as the later maintenance endpoints. So when we consider vetalizumab in maintenance through week 52 for Crohn's disease, we do see a benefit over placebo in terms of remission and response and steroid-free remission as well out to 52 weeks. These are the ulcerative colitis data for vetalizumab, showing a statistical benefit in terms of clinical response, clinical remission, and mucosal healing. And then finally, the maintenance data with vetalizumab and ulcerative colitis. The orange is the every eight-week vetalizumab. Green is every four-week vetalizumab, which was also statistically better um, than placebo for ulcerative colitis. So again, I quickly went through what I think you've seen before in terms of the anti-TNFs and the anti-integrin. Um, I'd like to present what I think are going to be the next two or potentially next two agents likely to be approved, at least in the United States, for inflammatory bowel disease, and that's ustekimumab uh, and tofacinimib. And just briefly to touch on these, ustekimumab, which as you know is approved for psoriasis, and we have used in our patients after anti-TNF with psoriasis and Crohn's disease, um, and will likely be labeled at some point in the next two years. This is the New England Journal of Medicine, ustekimumab induction and maintenance therapy for refractory Crohn's disease. This is an anti-IL-1223, it's specific to the P40 molecule, and it's again impossible to see that small diagram, but essentially blocks the IL-1223 pathway, which is one of the important pathways in all immune-mediated inflammatory uh, diseases. The data with ustekimumab, um, this is the initial study in terms of moderate to severe Crohn's and induction. Uh, this is given a single intravenous infusion at week zero, comparing placebo on the left-hand side and then one 
three and six milligram per kilogram used to kimumab and looking at the clinical response. And you can see a statistical benefit with the one and six milligram per kilogram infusion of used to kimumab. This is a monoclonal antibody. It is commercially available at this point for psoriasis, so there may be some in the room that have used this already in inflammatory bowel disease. In terms of the maintenance data in the number of subjects in clinical remission at week 22, based on initial response, this was using ustekimumab at a 90 milligram subcutaneous injection at week 8 and 16, and placebos on the left and subcutaneous ustekimumab on the right, and again, a statistical benefit. So I think that this has real promise as a potential next medication uh, for Crohn's disease. Um, again, safety, you can look at your slide, but the bottom line is in terms of the safety signal with ustekimumab, there was not a difference compared to placebo. I would also tell you that there seems to be an interesting position in using ustekimumab after anti-TNF non-responders or loss of responders. So stay tuned on that because there may be some potential in that re realm. And then the final new agent potentially to come and not yet FDA approved is tofacinimib. And this will be the potentially the first oral um, biologic, if you will. This is a Janase kinase inhibitor, a JAK uh, inhibitor for ulcerative colitis. It does block early in the cytokine cascade. It is a potent immunosuppressant. Um, it is approved right now uh, for rheumatoid arthritis. It's not yet approved for inflammatory bowel disease. Um, and tofacinumab in this study was given twice a day for eight weeks for moderate to severely active ulcerative colitis. The left-hand set of bars was response. The right-hand set of bars were remission. And there was a statistical benefit, and especially in a dose-dependent way, over placebo. It is a small molecule, and as I mentioned, um, is given orally. Interestingly found in the study, and I think the um, concept of safety question remains, is there was an increase in the LDL and HDL in terms of cholesterol. So I think that's something to keep in mind as we look to position this uh, treatment. So um, in the last part of my talk, I think this is what we're probably asking the most. Uh, what I presented up until now was a review of the data to put this into context for both Drs. Rubin and Hanauer as they review and talk about proactive or reactive treatment. Um, but these are the questions that we're wondering in our clinics and in our practices. And how do we position biologics? Um, I think some of this has to do, obviously, with an insurance on what's on label. I think the real question that we want is efficacy. And to date, at least, there are no head-to-head -head comparative efficacy studies. It is hard to uh, compare across trials. We do it all the time. But I think we need to be cautioned in saying that that's something we can apply. Demographics, in terms of will we use these agents in terms of gender, age, weight, pregnancy? Are there differences between the currently approved biologics? It, how does adherence play a role? the severity of disease, the subtypes of disease, so whether a patient has a fistula, extraintestinal manifestations, post-op. And then pharmacokinetics, and I'll come to in a minute the drug levels. There are two agents that we can measure drug levels, and is therapeutic drug monitoring important, and will that be a factor in which of the biologics we approve? And then finally, safety in terms of if a patient has an active or a prior infection or malignancy. This is common question that we wonder. And then the need for concomitant immunomodulators. So this next slide is essentially my uh, version of what, uh, sorry, this is not the next slide, but cost. We can't forget cost, and there are no comparative data in terms of cost between one and the other. And as we work closer with our payers, I think that this is a question that's often raised. Um, so this table, and again, maybe projecting small, but hopefully on your screens, um, this is my opinion. These aren't based on evidence. This is how I look at positioning the biologics in my practice. So on the left-hand column on the far side are the four anti-TNFs, one through four, and then natalizumab and vetalizumab. The indication is in the second column, which I've already reviewed. 
Then the question becomes in patients with severe active ulcerative colitis in the hospital or extensive Crohn's disease with fistula. I still think in that acute setting, especially in the hospitalized patient, um, that the IV formulation, specifically infliximab, may have a beneficial role in terms of being able to dose it differently. Now, I will tell you that the other anti-TNFs may also have a benefit if we were to use a higher dose. So we know that patients with a high CRP, a low albumin, will clear anti-TNF more quickly from the stool and from the body, and it may be more of a dosing issue with the subcutaneous agents rather than this, the IV formulation. So using higher dose earlier and more repeatedly may be a benefit. Um, I think the anti-integrin molecules, at least in the short term with vedolizumab, for a very sick inpatient with ulcerative colitis, probably takes a little bit of time. So whether we use vedolizumab and link it to steroid, whether we use cyclosporin or some other modality, I think that's a, a topic that remains to be seen. In terms of safety, moving across to the fourth column, um, I think safety in general, we feel that with the large registry data with anti-TNFs, that the anti-TNFs are all about the same in terms of safety. Um, I think when we look to the natalizumab, we've already talked about JC virus positivity in patients then developing potentially PML. Interestingly, at the bottom, I put vetalizumab with two pluses um, because of the gut selectivity and the potential possibly for less immunosuppression, vetalizumab may hold benefit in terms of patients who either have a malignancy or an active infection. So that's why I distinguish that a bit differently. Um, a need for concomitant immunomodulators. Again, this is my opinion. I put yes across all of them, and I like the background music. I didn't realize that started, but uh, hopefully that won't be too distracting. Maybe Maria and David will start dancing or something. Uh, that'll be interesting. Um, but background music aside, uh, the answer is yes to the immunomodulators because I think these are all potential for immunogenicity. The question becomes, vedolizumab in the North American trials use vedolizumab monotherapy without concomitant immunomodulator, and if we added a thiopurine to vedolizumab, would that safety benefit potentially change? And I think that's a question that remains. As far as drug monitoring, adalibumab and infliximab currently are the only two. Some patients, in terms of adherence, prefer IV. Some prefer sub-Q. Obviously, IV we can monitor. However, now with home nurses injecting some of the subcutaneous, I think adherence has gotten better. And then in terms of extraintestinal manifestations, certainly infliximab and adalibumab have been studied across different disease states and extraintestinal uh, disease uh, states as well. I put down at the very far right-hand bottom a question, a question to think about. Vedolizumab is gut-selective, but there is uptake in the biliary tree. And the question is whether primary sclerosing cholangitis there would be an impact with vedolizumab. There are no data. There are studies being planned, but this is a question that remains. So I'm going to end just by showing um, uh, the therapeutic pipeline of Crohn's disease is, uh, again, vast. We have now three anti-TNFs, two anti-integrin, but there are any, uh, many other molecules that are currently being studied and in development. And by the way, this was published in the GUT 2012 uh, Denise article, so if you're looking for this uh, actual slide, it's in there. Um, and then the therapeutic pipeline for ulcerative colitis, again, three anti-TNFs, vedolizumab, and then the JAK inhibitors uh, to come. So I'm going to end, will the expansion of biologic therapy for IBD change what we tell our patients? I think this is how we've been practicing for a long time, and we still at some point are saying this to our patients. Take this medicine until either the prescription runs out or they release a new study, whichever comes first. Uh, and just to summarize, and I'm not going to read this entire slide because I already went through this in the talk, um, but I think we have a lot of potential agents on the horizon, and thank you very much for your attention.
All right, that's great. So Miguel has set us up really for the rest of the night with respect to the new agents that we have available to us and some that are on the horizon. So the next little bit, I'm going to present a case. And then I'm going to have David Rubin tell us a little bit about how he would approach this case, followed by Steve. And then there's going to be a lot of time for us to address some of the questions that I already see popping up on the screen. OK, so this is a patient of mine. She's 36. She has iliocolonic Crohn's disease. She actually used to see Steve Hanauer in Chicago. She's had disease since she's a teenager. And she's required a subtotal colectomy for colonic disease with a temporary ileostomy in the past for perianal disease and for very aggressive colonic disease. She believes diet is the best way to control her symptoms and wants to be as natural as possible and eats organic absolutely everything. She was given three doses of infliximab in the remote past, but she reports she never had a good response. And in fact, those three doses were given just before she was whisked off to surgery. She now has more than 20 bowel movements a day and abdominal pain. Half of those are at night. She's only on azathioprine. You could see her levels. Her CRP is elevated. Her fecal calprotectin is elevated. Her colonoscopy shows there's nothing that we can really remove surgically because it's the ileum and what's left of her colon is all involved. So in terms of next steps, uh, we started her on adalimumab. After 12 weeks, her symptoms had not improved and her inflammatory markers remained elevated. We checked an adalimumab level, which was four micrograms per mL with undetectable antibodies to adalimumab. We then changed her to weekly adalimumab, and after eight weeks of that, her level had gone up to 12, yet she only had a modest improvement in her symptoms and her fecal calprotectin had gone down very little. So what's next? Um, these are questions really I'm posing to my colleagues. Um, how does one follow patients on biologics, or anything really for that matter, with respect to a response? Should I have checked adalimumab levels at all? If I had already, should I have just made the decision to go to weekly and not check these levels? And if so, do we know what levels we're interested in achieving? And is there a role for changing to a different anti-TNF in this case? And how does one decide it's time for a change in mechanism of action? So I'll give this over to David to give us his uh, take on it. So we have some emerging nomenclature in the management of IBD from what we used to do in the past, which you all are familiar with, and maybe some of which you're still doing, which is symptom-based. Um, in terms like aggressive therapy and Hail Mary, um, last ditch efforts, saving something for last, all those types of comments. And what we've been talking about for perhaps the last five years or so in, in our world, which is much more about individualized care, personalized medicine, um, deep remission, uh, which is clinical remission plus some objective marker of disease control, as well as optimizing therapy, which is what we're going to spend some time thinking about tonight. Um, and lastly, I've circled there the concept of being proactive rather than being reactive. In other words, we've come to appreciate that when we wait for problems to occur, we're often waiting too long and that we're losing the opportunity to control the disease properly and to avoid complications. So why should we be proactive? Uh, well, it anticipates clinical outcomes and we therefore can uh, treat the patient uh, sooner and help them uh, actually have what we believe to be a changed natural history. It preserves therapeutic benefit and response to therapy, and now because we really can, and what do I mean by that? Well, we first have better understanding of the predictors of outcomes in IBD, thanks to some very good work that's been done. We have the ability to monitor disease activity in asymptomatic patients. Uh, we have more therapeutic options than ever before. And the knowledge that our therapies can change outcomes has evolved and accumulated. So by doing all of these things, we certainly have come to realize that we should and can treat patients more proactively. But very importantly, part of this was also the concept of developing therapeutic monitoring strategies, not just monitoring our therapies and the pharmacokinetics of our treatments, but also monitoring the disease activity in a variety of different ways.
So how can we actually incorporate this into practice? Well, you're all here tonight. We want to increase the fund of knowledge, not just among uh, the people who uh, do the research, but also, of course, all the people who are actually taking care of the patients. We want to try to make this as easy as possible, so it's not useful if we make things more complicated. You all know that that leads to problems. So in some ways, it's nice to algorithmatize what we're doing. In other words, we can create standard approaches that address individualized medicine, which may sound oxymoronic initially, but it actually does make sense. And therefore, we also need to then appreciate what the limits are to what we can do. In other words, if we decide everybody has to hit the same target, but we can't always get there, we're going to end up going through a lot of therapies that might not be effective and spending a lot of money. Uh, and lastly, our patients have to buy into this. And we heard about this case, and we'll talk a little bit more about how we can get this young woman engaged in the decision-making process. So Maria's patient then, which uh, at least partially is also Steve's patient, uh, we know her prognosis was for severe disease. She had a young age of onset. Prior, they're going to really show me over there, aren't they now? I can tell. <laughs> they're getting warmed up. Prior refractory disease and perianal involvement, all of which you know is associated with a more severe um, and um, significant prognosis. She had previous exposure to infliximab, and at the time, at least based on what we know, she was on monotherapy with infliximab and didn't get committed to maintenance, in part because we were told she had what sounded like a primary non-response. And she had inadequate disease monitoring, which means after her surgery, and in part maybe because she wanted to manage it with diet, maybe because she moved to Florida, um, she didn't have ongoing follow-up in some ways, and despite knowing the disease would come back, um, and she wasn't on preventive therapy. So there's a few things to consider. And now what we're faced with at the time uh, is that she has recurrent disease. It's a moderate activity symptomatically, but endoscopically it still looks a little bit worse, um, and her prognosis remains severe. And she's what I call the wishful thinking patient, which she would like to ma manage it by diet alone, but unfortunately we have seen that that hasn't quite done it for her yet. And she was tried on adalimumab monotherapy with dose escalation and is a primary non-responder. So the first step to being proactive is to understand your patient's prognosis. And I think I've outlined here what our patient's prognosis is in this situation. Um, but that really informs you about how aggressive you may be, not only in your choice of therapies, but in how you're going to follow them and how you're going to plan your follow-up in your office and your testing and your ongoing therapeutic monitoring. So monitoring the disease can actually inform both you and the patient um, before they have recurrent symptoms and complications. And we know that this can happen in patients who have had surgery and in whom uh, we've achieved some kind of controlled remission. One message to learn tonight is that if we choose to monitor, we should know what to do with the results. So for those of you who use CRP as a monitoring strategy for your patients with Crohn's, uh, you should know that when CRP is elevated, even in the clinically remitted patient or the asymptomatic patient, that's a patient who has a high risk of having a subsequent problem. So in this retrospective assessment from the University of Pittsburgh, where Miguel is, um, and led by David Binion, they saw that patients who had elevated CRP but clinically silent Crohn's were much more likely to end up hospitalized. And when I asked David more about this, he said it was usually for bowel obstructions. So you can actually um, understand that when you have an elevated CRP and the patient says, I feel fine, uh, first of all, you want to know what fine means, and second of all, you should probably pursue this and actually see where the disease is active and what treatment adjustments you might make. Now, despite the fact that we like CRP, it's useful and inexpensive, uh, the reality is that it also is nonspecific, and it comes up a little bit later than a stool marker called calprotectin, which many of you may be using. When you look at a variety of different choices, whether it's the clinical uh, symptoms, the CDAI, uh, the CRP, or even just uh, leukocyte counts, fecal calprotectin beats them all in terms of interpreting the distinction between active and inactive Crohn's. Um, it's especially useful when you've seen it elevated and then you follow it down and it's responded to treatment, but it's not perfect. For a patient with small bowel Crohn's especially, you should know that you can have falsely negative fecal calpros, and of course when patients have uh, intestinal infections, they're going to have elevated calpro that's not related to their IBD. Nonetheless, it's a useful marker to keep in mind. 
In a study in which patients on combination uh, infliximab and immunomodulator therapies had the infliximab stopped, they looked at CRP and fecal CalPRO subsequently to follow those patients out. And they found that the CalPRO went up sooner than the CRP, but both markers were reasonable to follow those patients to predict subsequent clinical relapse. So you can imagine using this in clinical practice and understanding when the patient was likely to have a problem. The cutoff for CRP in this analysis was when it hit 6, that was likely to predict a relapse, and the CalPRO was about 300, which is a little higher than previous work has looked at for CalPRO. Um, but nonetheless, you can understand that it's not going from a normal CalPRO to a slightly elevated one. You need to think about it being significant enough that it's going to impact on what you're going to do for the patient. Now, we also know that in patients who achieve remission and are in stable maintenance on adalimumab, you can use fecal CalPRO to predict the likelihood of relapse. And this has been shown nicely in this particular study, uh, which demonstrated that when the patient had an elevated fecal CalPRO, despite being in clinical remission on adalimumab, it predicted that they would subsequently relapse. So this certainly applies across the board. In Maria's patient who had had surgery, you should know as well that you can use markers like this in the post-op patient. So although, again, this is not a perfect marker, it certainly gives us some clues. This is a subset analysis that's been now published in Gastro um, from the POKER trial, which was the adalimumab post-op study, in which they looked at fecal CalPRO and then saw whether or not it correlated with what was found when they had colonoscopy subsequently. And in fact, they found that a fecal CalPRO higher than 100 predicted the likelihood of finding um, lesions when you did your scope. But the way they interpreted it and the stronger evidence was that when the fecal CalPRO was less than 100, you were unlikely to find anything. In other words, the negative predictive value was stronger, and therefore you could avoid a colonoscopy in that situation. So I think we've moved to a point where we can consider these markers in specific patients and use the information to guide us to treat them more effectively. Now, uh, between the results of that poker trial and some other data looking at post-op Crohn's, um, one of our advanced fellows in IBD, Britt Christensen, and I just created sort of a modified algorithm of the approach to the post-operative patient. And it's similar to what many of you are already doing in the sense of thinking about their risk stratification in terms of treatment immediately post-op. But we threw in the fecal CalPRO at three months as a way in your higher risk patients to have a better sense of what might be going on rather than waiting six months or longer before you do your colonoscopy. And this is based on the idea that if we wait too long before we actually look and know what's happening, we lose the window of opportunity to get the disease under better control. Now, many therapies have been studied as preventive strategies in uh, Crohn's after surgery, and this is a classic example of being proactive as well. So the idea is we recognize that some patients have a risk of recurrent Crohn's, in fact most do, and we can use medical therapy to try and prevent it. Uh, an important message here is that there is a distinction between endoscopic recurrence and clinical recurrence. We know that that, uh, that endoscopic recurrence, of course, precedes clinical recurrence, and you can look at a variety of therapies uh, to see which ones are most likely to be effective. Nonetheless, the point here is that for years in the post-op Crohn's patient, we've all been thinking proactively, or at least you should be, and this is another example of how we should be much more proactive in our patients. In fact, I often tell patients who are heading to surgery for a resection and primary anastomosis that I think one of the areas we've made the most progress in Crohn's disease management is how we approach patients postoperatively in terms of monitoring them, scoping them, and adjusting therapies. So another major message at this meeting and previously and something that's evolving is this concept of whether or not we have burned our bridges when you've exposed someone to an anti-TNF agent and they can't stay on it for whatever particular reason. Um, so if you have a patient who got three doses of infliximab, remember this patient got those doses, didn't respond, and then went to surgery. So you might say, well, does that mean the mechanism really failed, or did the patient just need surgery all along, and therefore um, this particular therapy, and for that matter, the class of therapy may still be worthwhile in this individual. So keep in mind that we have learned a lot about anti-TNF therapies. There's going to be a nice session on that on Tuesday afternoon here. Uh, but recognizing that there are reasons that we do loading, that we consider combination therapy in many patients, especially our high-risk ones, we commit to maintenance when we have a response, uh, and then, of course, we have a careful and thoughtful assessment to the loss of response before we jump to other therapies or a different class. 
So was Maria's patient really a primary anti-TNF non-responder? Well, it's not clear, but at least within the limits of the label for infliximab, three doses of five milligrams per kilogram and no response suggests that whether they needed surgery or not, the, she was a primary non-responder. But the other part of this is could you have predicted something else or adjusted her dose? So we have some emerging literature that early infliximab levels can guide you and predict the likelihood of responding over time. So if you look here, you can see that having an infliximab level at week 14 that was detectable was enough to predict persistent remission by week 54. So you can know early whether your patient's going to do all right or whether you should be considering dose adjustment or a different treatment mechanism altogether. And if you look at something that's uh, of interest as well, a sustained durable remission, which means that there's no breakthrough and you're not just looking at a single point in time, um, the same finding is true. So earlier use of therapeutic drug monitoring may be a way that we predict and save ourselves money and also be proactive in dose-adjusting therapy. Let's talk for a minute about what I called the wishful thinking patient who's managing it with diet. Um, and I include in parentheses the wishful thinking doctor who has to help the patient go along with this. Um, and it doesn't mean that diet doesn't have a role. It just means that we all have to be on the same page. So this allows me to introduce another concept related to proactive therapy, and that's the treat-to-target paradigm, which we've borrowed from rheumatology and cardiovascular diseases and diabetes, in which a patient and the clinician have a shared decision to move through therapies in a sequential way with serial disease monitoring to obtain and achieve some identified target. Target can be many different things. In our field, we often say, well, it's mucosal healing, but really, it might be normalization of the CRP. It might be something as simple as we want you to stop bleeding. You can imagine other targets. But the concept here is that you and the patient are on the same page. You're using some objective and agreed upon goal in order to manage them, and you move through uh, the treatment strategies serial and, and over time. Now, uh, what we've recently shown uh, in a position paper that, or at least a paper that we wrote and, and have published in the Red Journal, was that you can use a treat-to-target paradigm to engage your patient in a better shared decision-making approach. So in a patient, for instance, who says to you, I want to manage my disease with diet, you can say, I understand why that's important to you. Let's agree that we're going to have some way to look at your disease activity now and after you try that for some period of time. And together, we're going to work through this. And if it's not doing what we need it to do, we can then move on together. So it really, I think, helps you get on the same page, gives the patient the um, opportunity to explore what's really important to them, but gets you back on track if it's not working. Now, there actually has been a treat-to-target study done, um, and I'm not here to explain this entire algorithm, but it was an algorithmic approach to managing Crohn's in some centers that were randomized to this versus other centers, not patients, centers that were randomized to their, their standard management of Crohn's patients. And it was essentially this, using uh, objective measures and adjusting dosing of therapies um, with the idea that they were going to look at a primary endpoint, which was the Harvey Bradshaw Index and steroid-free um, response and remission. Uh, and unfortunately, or fortunately, whatever you want to decide about this, of looking at a primary endpoint that admittedly was more symptom-based of all things after a treat-to-target paradigm, um, they didn't show a difference between those centers, maybe because the standard of care approach was pretty good in many of the places, maybe because the patients weren't sick enough. But interestingly, the secondary endpoints of this study showed that the patients who were using this uh, algorithm were less likely to be hospitalized and have surgery. So there may be a role for doing this. And if you haven't already done it, or you might be sitting here saying, I already do this in my practice. I move them up the ladder. This gives you some more structure to it. And I would encourage you to continue thinking about that. So back to Maria's patient, um, is this really primary non-response? Would higher doses um, work better? So if we could give her more uh, of the adalimumab, could we get there? Would combination therapy improve our pharmacokinetics? Probably. Would that actually get her under the control we need? Not clear. Could we go back to infliximab, or is that um, ship sailed already? Uh, and I'll talk to you a little bit about that. And of course, should we be just thinking about a completely different mechanism in this uh, young woman? So how might we go back to infliximab? Well, the reality is that, sorry, that's my timer telling me. Um, the reality is that people have looked at this a bit. There's actually a number of studies now in the literature that 
have shown that patients who've had a drug holiday from either infliximab or adalimumab might be able to safely go back to it. Of course, what we had been taught was that you're going to have a higher risk for an immunogenic or a hypersensitivity reaction, and that is true. But in certain patient populations, you um, may be able to, to either pre prevent that from happening or predict that it's going to happen. In particular, I'll call you your attention to the um, the uh, recent publication by Barrett and colleagues where they described an approach to doing this that I've algorithmatized for you here. So in a patient who receives their infliximab um, and they have either a loss of response to it or an intentional discontinuation or an un unintentional discontinuity of therapy and they've gone for six months or more off therapy, um, if you choose to go back to it, because sometimes patients say, you know, I'm on this new drug that you started for me, but I never felt as well as I did when I was on the first drug. Well, the idea here would be that you might um, restart the drug, but instead of just crossing your fingers and hoping they don't have a reaction, you can actually check infliximab level and antibodies to the infliximab seven to 14 days after they get their first reinduction dose. And then based on those results, have a pretty good idea what might happen. So uh, if they don't have any antibodies against infliximab and they have infliximab level that's measurable and higher than two micrograms per ml, um, this is associated in the Barrett study and in some of the other work with short-term and long-term response. If they have ATIs that are not detectable and the infliximab is detectable but less than two, um, that was associated at least with short-term response but not necessarily the same good result. And if they had ATIs present after you did that uh, drug level um, and at all, then the infusion reaction was likely when you give them their second reinduction dose and you're going to have a problem and you should avoid it and not waste your time and go right on to something else. I think this is reasonable for a subset of patients. It's not for the patient who has an infusion reaction and comes off the infliximab for that particular reason. This is for all those other reasons I've listed there in the top uh, box. So if she did respond, then the idea here is could you do proactive therapeutic monitoring? And for any of our therapies, I think that this is of interest. And this retrospective assessment of patients in Boston, what we see here in blue are patients who had their infliximab level checked routinely, uh, even and especially when they were in clinical remission. And the dose was either increased or decreased to keep it within a range. And the patients who had that done were much more likely to stay on therapy and stay in remission than those patients who did not have that done who are in red, um, who uh, actually had a much greater likelihood of losing response over time or getting off therapy. So this allows us to think about a future in which we might be very proactive in checking levels uh, provided that they're affordable and we have more data uh, on a regular basis in our stable patients to continue them on appropriate therapy, potentially saving money both directly and indirectly. So I've covered a lot to think about in terms of proactive management. I've tried to tie it to Maria's patient today, um, but the idea is could we have prevented this altogether? Uh, maybe if she had been um, followed up or had the opportunity to be on therapy postoperatively, um, and could she have stayed on infliximab postoperatively given her prognosis? I think today many of us would have considered doing that, and, and certainly years ago we weren't quite yet. Um, I think the treat to target approach to gaining control is reasonable, but also helps you discuss with her the diet interest that she has and demonstrating that it's not changing her biomarkers. Uh, and I also gave you a little bit of information about adalimumab and a proactive approach to restarting infliximab. Of course, if that's not the right treatment, then you need to be thinking about different mechanisms. And that's, of course, where Miguel's nice talk comes in and thinking about anti integrin um, and other therapies is appropriate. So thank you very much. That, that was really a great overview of how to manage these complicated patients. The next speaker is Dr. Stephen Hanauer, who is director of the Digestive Health Center at Northwestern, who's going to tell us a slightly different approach, but really a complimentary uh, talk to what David has just told us.